which was painted the illusion of my happiness. Now I see nothing but a certain and near death. I shall cherish my tortures if they shorten my existence. I send you the letter I received yesterday. It will speak for itself. Receive, madam, the only farewell I shall make and grant my last Prayer, it is to leave me to my fate, to forget me entirely, to feel as if I were no longer on the earth. There is a limit in misery, after which friendship itself increases our sufferings, cannot heal them. Nothing now can suit me, save the profound night where I go. Bury my shame. There I shall weep my errors if I can still weep. Since yesterday, I've not been able to shed a tear. Farewell, madam. Do not reply to me. I have sworn upon that cruel letter never to receive another. I hear at last, Madame de Torvel has gone to her convent and is not expected home. But certainly she's doing the right thing. The convent is the proper refuge for a widow, and this will only increase the celebrity I earn from this adventure. I am sorry, though, that she found the strength to separate herself from me so completely. I, would it not be better to bring the woman back to the point of hoping for reconciliation? Uh, of course, it would be an attempt we would make together, and then I could repeat this sacrifice at your will. And now, my fair friend, I still have to receive my reward, and all my wishes are for your return. The Volange girl seems quite recovered, and only the fresher and more attractive for it. Uh, really, it, she made me want to find out if her cure is complete. But I have decided to hand her back to your sentimental Dancigny. Her accident almost drove him mad with anxiety, and since Madame de Volange consented to allow him to congratulate the girl on her recovery, he is now installed there as of old. It is impossible to describe his joy. Goodbye, my fair friend. Come back quickly and find once again your lover, your pleasures, your friends, and the regular course of adventures. You will certainly be as distressed as I am, my worthy friend, when you learn of Madame de Torvel's condition. A burning fever a violent and almost continual delirium, a thirst which nothing can quench. The doctors say that the treatment will be more difficult because the patient obstinately refuses any assistance whatsoever to such an extent that she had to be held down by force to be bled. You who saw her as I did, so delicate, so timid, and so gentle, can you imagine that four persons could hardly restrain her? For my part, I am afraid it is not only delirium, but a real mental alienation. 
at the convent. She inquired if the room she occupied as a schoolgirl was vacant, and when shown to it, she declared that she had come back to live in a room which she ought never to have left, and would only leave it in death. She now alternates between unconsciousness and delirium, often begging to be left alone in darkness, which she says befits her. But she seemed to regain consciousness for a moment when she saw me. She took my hand and she said to me, I am dying because I did not believe you. I am dying because I did not believe you. I fear this cruel illness has a still more cruel cause. What is most distressing is her persistence in refusing all attention and help. Goodbye, my worthy friend. I must now go to the patient. Seriously, Vicomte, you have deserted Madame de Torvel. You sent her the letter I composed for her. I admit freely that this triumph flatters me more than any I have obtained up until now. You will perhaps think I value this woman very highly after having formally rated her so low. Not at all. I have not obtained this advantage over her, but over you. Yes, Vicomte, you loved Madame de Dorbel very much, and you still love her. You love her like a madman. But because I amused myself by making you ashamed of it, you have bravely sacrificed her. I marvel at how you calmly proposed that I should let you patch things up with her. So she would still think herself the one choice of your heart, while I should pride myself on being the preferred rival. But when I struck her, or rather, when I guided your blows, I did not forget that you had placed me beneath her. I invite you to try every means of reconciliation, but I am very much at ease upon this matter. I shall be back in Paris very soon. I cannot tell you which day positively, but you shall be the first to be informed of my arrival. Goodbye, Vicomte. In spite of my quarrels, my tricks, my reproaches, I still love you very much, and I am prepared to prove it to you as agreed upon. Until we meet, my friend. At last I am leaving here, my young friend, and tomorrow evening I shall be back in Paris. You know the confusion I'm settling back in. I shall receive no one. I will accept you from the general rule, but I beg you to keep my arrival a secret. But no, now that your Cecile is in Paris and you see her sometimes, you have no time for your friends. I do not count upon seeing you tomorrow evening then, unless love leaves you free and unoccupied, and I forbid you to make the least sacrifice. Goodbye, Chevalier. It will be a great delight to see you again. Will you come? Oh, you whom I love, you who I adore, sensitive friend, tender lover, what reproaches have you to make yourself? You have not betrayed our friendship, and neither have I abused your trust. Just even yesterday, in spite of the extreme pleasure I felt at the idea of seeing you, I still thought I was guided by friendship alone. But we both only recognized love when we emerged from that ecstasy into which God has plunged us. Uh, will you now share the desire of my heart, the, the delirium of my senses, the, the ecstasy of my soul? While awaiting the pleasure of seeing you, I abandon myself to the pleasure of writing you. But 
the hour at last approaches when I can visit you. It would be impossible for me to leave you if it were not to go and see you.